We're looking at the story from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 5, uh, beginning of the first verse, that talks about an individual by the name of Naaman. And we're going to pray and then ask the Lord to lead us in the study of his word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the, the wonderful book, the Bible, that reveals you to us and shows us that you are a God who is strong. And in the story that we're going to look at today, as we see how that strength was exhibited in healing Naaman, we pray that the lesson will come home to us, that you can help us, you can redeem, you can save us from whatever bad position our choices have put ourselves in, you are stronger. So Lord, bless us as we study your word now, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1 says, Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Well, looking at some of the uh, items in that verse, it says Naaman, that was his name, an interesting name because it actually means pleasant or sweet. There was a name that uh, was given to the lady folk who had that uh, same name, and it was Naomi. You might remember that name from the Bible. But Naaman was the masculine form of that. And uh, it tells us that he was commander of the army of the king of, of the Syrians. The word commander is an interesting word there. It's in Hebrew, it's the word czar. And of course, later, other kingdoms, other cultures adopted that word. And in Russia, it was the czars. For the Romans, it was the Caesars. Uh, later, the Germans used that same word to put a hard C sound to it, and they were the Kaisers. Uh, but it was the same word. He was the commander. He was the czar. In the Bible, the great czar is Jesus. Uh, another, another study for another time. But Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Syria. And we're going to see in this story that the Lord reached out to heal Naaman. And there's a very powerful lesson in that because uh, God's love wasn't exclusive just to the people of Israel. It was to go to all the world. And that's a lesson that the Bible gives to us in a very profound way, that, that every single person on this planet is a, a candidate for salvation. Jesus died on the cross to save all of us, no matter where we were born or when we were born. And uh, this lesson, this story brings that out. So he was commander, czar of the army of the king of Syria. And look at the qualifications. It lists here. He was a great and honorable man. And the word there means exalted or lifted up, held in high esteem. He was an honorable man in the eyes of his master, but not only that, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. So he was given recognition or acknowledgement by his peers, his earthly leaders, but also it said he was blessed of the Lord. So all these good things in his favor. What a, what a resume, what a ledger. By him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor. He was not only a leader, but apparently he was a warrior. He was used to going out and bearing the sword. Now, in the Hebrew language, uh, the verse that we're reading at has 17 words that list his great accomplishments. All these things up to that point. But the verse has 18 words. There's one more word. And that word counteracts everything that we read so far. All these great attainments, all these great accomplishments are overridden, are superseded by one word. And that word was leper. Now, in our Bibles, it says, but he was a leper, five words, but in Hebrew, it's just one word. 17 words, all his great accomplishments, then one word, leper, because that, that uh, wiped out everything that was there uh, in his favor before. Now, leprosy in the Bible was a, a dreaded disease. Um, in the Bible, it's used as an illustration of sin, because like, like leprosy, sin begins on the inside, and then it exhibits portrays on the outside. Like leprosy, uh, it is ugly, and uh, it, it uh, uh, looks atrocious. And a person afflicted with leprosy, uh, after a time, their fingers, their ears, their toes would begin to drop off. It was loathsome. And it resulted in separation, like sin does. Uh, leprosy, from the human point of view back in Bible days, was incurable. If you had it, it was basically a death decree, a death sentence. But the other point that we want to bring out is that, that uh, Jesus can heal leprosy. And when he was on this earth, he healed lepers many times. So leprosy in the Bible is used as a symbol of sin. And here now, 
Uh, Naaman, this great commander, all his accomplishments are wiped out by that one word, leprosy. Sin, uh, one word, one thing can spoil a good record. Now, I have this piece of paper here, and if I were to hold it up and uh, ask the question, what do you see on this piece of paper? Well, most of us would look at that and say, I, I see a, a dark spot. I see a, a black dot. But in reality, the black dot on that piece of paper occupies less than 1% of the surface of the paper. There's a whole lot of white, but there's one black dot that, uh, that uh, focuses our attention. And so it is with sin that somebody can live a great life, and yet one mistake can uh, do away with it all. So we want to be careful to live holy lives because one mistake can uh, cause great damage. So here's Naaman, and he contracts leprosy. And uh, the story continues in verse 2. It says, the Syrians had gone out on raids. They had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, if only my master was with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would heal him of his leprosy. Now, this, this girl is a, um, is a mystery. We don't know her name. All we know is that she was taken on a raid, taken from Israel. And you can think about this young lady and... Uh, what might have gone through her mind as she's taken captive, it's almost as if her life is over, removed from her homeland, her friends, her family. And she might have taken the approach to murmur and complain and become despondent, become negative in her life, but that's not apparently what she did. She maintained a cheerful outlook, and she was a great person of faith. Why do I say that? Well, she said, boy, it's too bad that uh, uh, he couldn't make connection with the prophet in Samaria, that would be Elisha, because he would heal uh, him of his leprosy. Now, there's no record that Elisha had conducted any healings of leprosy in his career, although he had performed many miracles. No record that he had healed leprosy at this point. As a matter of fact, in order to find a recorded episode of somebody actually being healed from leprosy, you have to go back a long ways. You have to go back to the story of Miriam, which is six or seven centuries before this. The story of Elisha's about in the eighth century. And the story of Miriam is somewhere in the 14th, 15th century. So in today's world, we would say you'd have to go back to like the 1400s to find an episode when this, something like this actually happened. And yet she said, so matter of factly, boy, it's too bad that uh, he couldn't uh, meet up with Elisha. Elisha would heal him of his leprosy. What an astounding statement of, that, of faith. The Bible brings to light people that God used to further his ministry and they're anonymous. They're anonymous. We don't know this little girl's name. I think someday we'll have a chance to meet her. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being in heaven? And you're walking down Glory Avenue, and there's a large crowd forming down the street there, and you're wondering what's going on, what's happening, and you go down there and say, well, everybody wants to meet the girl who suggested Naaman could be healed by Elisha. I'd like to meet that little girl, wouldn't you? So anyway, she said, it's too bad that uh, he can't uh, make a connection with Elisha. So uh, word got to Naaman, and from there to the king of, uh, of Syria. And so he prepared a letter, and uh, this is what he said. I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. So following proper protocol uh, and arrangements, uh, he's going to write, the, the king of Syria is going to write to the king of Israel and uh, get the introduction going there. So he writes this letter. He says, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. He departed and took with him, look what he took with him. We're going to discuss this later in the story. He took with him 10 talents of silver and 6,000 shekels of gold. Now, the, the uh, 10 talents of silver, if you equate that into today's monetary values, uh, may not seem that impressive. It was about $15,000. Still a pretty good size of change, for sure, but it was $15,000. But the 6,000 shekels of silver, of gold, now that's another story. We don't know exactly uh, the, the monetary value, but we know uh, what was paid to workers back in their culture. And two shekels of gold would hire an unskilled worker for a month. So if you do the math, 6,000 shekels would have hired 250 servants, workers, for a year. Quite a... Quite a uh, Quite a present going on with him. And then he threw in 10 changes of clothing. So he brought the letter to the king of Israel. 
He said, be advised, when this letter comes to you, I've sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. But the king of Israel was not a person of faith. In fact, he kind of exhibited some uh, characteristics of immaturity. It happened when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and make alive? Well, we find that uh, from his response, it gives an indication of how serious contracting leprosy was. It was as if uh, the man uh, was uh, on death row. Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a uh, man for me to heal him of leprosy? Therefore, look, consider, he's trying to start a war with me. He's making this request just so we can have uh, room to, uh, a reason to uh, get in a fight. But, continuing there in verse 8, it was so when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. This is going to change the story now. So Naaman went with his horses and his chariot. He stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger to him and said, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. Now, this man had come from Syria, but he was acquainted with the geography, the topography of Israel. And if there was one thing that the Jordan River was known for, it was known to be muddy. And so this was a, a command that didn't make any sense to him at all. How can I be clean if I wash in the muddy Jordan? You know, sometimes what God tells us to do may not make sense to us. Uh, but in his great love and in his reaching out to us, he, he gives us commands. And if we follow them in faith good things happen. Well, he said, I've got better rivers in Syria. Can't I wash in those and be clean? Uh, and he went away in a huff. And furthermore, he was mad because Elisha himself didn't come out to meet him. He sent this messenger. And he said, I was expecting that Elisha would come out and wave his hands and there'd be some, you know, gesticulations and some movements or whatever. And through that, I'd be healed. So his expectations were uh, not fulfilled. And because of that, he was disappointed and uh, it left in a rage. Uh, when you think of the Bible stories, you can think of many times when God's ways didn't seem to make sense, and yet they were effect effective. Uh, in Egypt, the Lord said, what I want you to do is take the blood of the lamb and put it over your doorpost, and then your firstborn child will be spared. That may not have made a lot of sense, but it was effective. In Noah's day, the command was, get into the boat. Well, that didn't make sense. It had never rained before. But those that obeyed the command were spared. Uh, in the story in John chapter 2 of the wedding feast where they ran out of beverage, uh, Mary said, whatever he says, do it. And Jesus said, I want you to fill those six large jars with water. That didn't seem to make sense. But when they obeyed, good things happened. So when God tells us to do something, even if it doesn't seem to make sense to our way of thinking, uh, it's best to follow. So he says, are not my rivers, the Abana and the Farpar, better rivers? Could it not wash and then them be clean? And he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants, cooler minds, prevailed. His servants came near and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? If the prophet had said, I want you to go and climb Mount Ararat, or I want you to go into this battle and defeat 100,000 of the enemy or something, do something great, wouldn't you have done it? And the obvious answer would be yes. Uh, so they reasoned then, well, why don't you do this small thing? It may not seem to make sense, but why not do it? You're here anyway. So he went down, verse 14, he dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. So try to picture, there's Naaman in the river, and he's wondering about this. He dips down in the river once, nothing, still leprosy. Twice, same thing, all the way through six, and nothing seems to have happened. And then on the seventh dip, when he comes out, what a miracle. It says his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. I imagine there was some celebrating going on when Naaman came out that, that uh, seventh time. You know, the Bible reveals our great God as a God who goes beyond expectations. We think of him as the God of the second mile. Uh, think about it this way. If Naaman had come out of the uh, seventh dip there and he had his old wrinkled skin, we're presuming that he was a man of age, being a commander and so on. If he'd come out with his old uh, skin, with the um, uh, wrinkles and so on, the gray hair and all, 
uh, but he was free of leprosy, well, he would have been ecstatic, of course. But that is not what happened. Because God is the God of the second mile. It says when he came out, he had the flesh of a little child. So this raises some questions in my mind. When Naaman went home with the flesh of a little child, I wonder if his family recognized him. I wonder if he came to the door and they looked at him and said in their minds, who are you? Uh, when God heals, it is an abundant uh, beyond what is necessary healing. So he returned to the man of God and uh, he, he uh, said, I, I, now I know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. So he had the the 10 talents of silver. He had the 6,000 shekels of gold that would buy 250 servants for a year. And he had the 10 uh, changes of clothing. And he said, please take this. And Elisha said, no, I'm not going to take anything. Why? Because the Lord wanted to impress upon Naaman's mind the truth that grace, salvation, is not bought by money. Grace is free. And that's a lesson we need to know, know today, isn't it? Uh, there's a gospel song that brings out that idea of if a religion was a thing that money could buy, the, the uh, rich would live and the poor would die. But that's not the way that it is. God's grace is free to every single person. And it was in this case to Naaman. So what do we see in this story as we, th we think about it? We see that God's love reaches all. You didn't have to be a Hebrew. You didn't have to be a son of Abraham to experience God's salvation. Naaman, a Syrian captain, was rescued by the Lord. When the Lord looks at planet Earth, he does not see lines on it. Lines and fences are something that humans have, have made. But God sees everybody on this planet as his son and his daughter. Naaman was, was a child of God, and he was a recipient of God's grace. We see in the story that there's nothing too hard for God. What seemed impossible, a disease that couldn't be cured, was nothing. We see that faith wins. Faith expressed by the little maiden. Oh, if he could just beat Elisha, even though it went six centuries before that the last recorded episode of, of uh, leprosy being healed was, was, was there. We see that God uses people to minister his grace. There were many people that were involved in this, in this story, and they all came together uh, for a, a good purpose. So God wants to use every one of us to bring the healing, bring the grace to people that are around us, like the maiden did, like the servants of, of Naaman did. We, feel, we see that sometimes the way that we think things should go aren't the way that God has it planned, but it's best if we follow what God has, has put in place. And we see that God is the God of the second mile. He can do abundantly above all that we think or ask. And this story brings that out. And finally, we see that salvation is free. Every one of us, no matter where we were born, no matter where we live, can be the recipient of God's grace and be healed from the leprosy of sin. When God looks at people, he looks at the heart, the Bible says. And even though the out outward appearance may be, may be pleasant, uh, as it was in the case of Damon, uh, still the heart may be defiled by sin. But Jesus can bring healing. It doesn't matter if there's been a bad habit or bad choices that have, have gripped your life and caused you to go down a, a wrong path. Jesus can break us free. Jesus can give us help. So in this beautiful story of Naaman, all these wonderful lessons are brought to view. And I hope that there's somebody watching our program today that receives the grace of Christ, maybe for the first time, and reaches out and says, I want that blessing. I want to be healed of sin. I want Jesus in my life. That's my prayer today. Strong enough to calm the storms, fear and unbelief, fierce enough to break the cord of death that clung to me. Strong. Oh, your love is strong. 
safe enough to hold me near. My fear is crippling. Safe enough to be my home. But my world is crumbling. Cause I have come to know a love who's stronger than You make beautiful things 
You. 